So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Harley Erdman. My pronouns are he, him. I'm chair of the UMass Department of Theater, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the fourth and final episode in our series, Women in Theatrical Design. The series responds to a pressing problem. Women are still woefully underrepresented in theater design and technical fields. According to a 2015 study, professional positions nationwide featured men as 86% of the lighting designers, 79% of the scenic designers, and 91% of the sound designers. We're fortunate that at UMass, all four of our faculty designers are women, but UMass is not representative of the larger field. So over the course of March, we've invited four outstanding women designers to share their perspectives, talk about their craft, and offer their inspirations. Um, we've been lucky to welcome illustrious um, guest costume, sound, and lighting designers. And today, last but not least, we have uh, an illustrious guest scenic designer. I first want to have some thank you, offer some thank yous. Um, the series is made possible with support from Women for UMass Amherst, um, WFUM, a network of alumni that promotes the advancement of campus programs that provide access, support, and opportunity for UMass students with preference to those projects that positively impact UMass Amherst women and their respective communities. I also want to give a big thanks to Anna Maria Gosens, to Willow Cohen, to um, the, my faculty design colleagues, Amy Altadonna, Yao Chen, Anya Klepikoff, and Penny Remsen, to Karen Battistoni, and especially to alum Jordan Mitchell, who was a superstar in helping us secure this grant. I also want to acknowledge that we gather as the University of Massachusetts Amherst Department of Theater on the traditional land of the Nipmuc Wabanaki Confederacy and the Bakumtuk peoples past and present, whose ancient relationships with the land continue to this day. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. Please take a moment to celebrate the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have shown worldwide. And for those of us joining from another location, you can check out the link in the chat to find out more about indigenous communities where you live. So now I'm honored to welcome the host for today's conversation, um, UMass Professor of Scenic Design, Anya Klepikoff. Anya is a prolific scenic and costume designer for theater, opera, and dance. Her long list of productions includes work at Miami City Ballet, Triad Stage, Weston Playhouse, Barishnikov Art Center, Glimmergrass, Glimmerglass Opera, Syracuse Stage, and many other places. She's taught at Princeton, at Brown, Colgate, and Yale, uh, my favorite recent credits of Anna is that uh, recently in the, basically the same year, she designed costumes for one production of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf in Vermont and scenery for an entirely different production of the same play in North Carolina. Uh, friends, um, here is Anya Klepikoff who is going to introduce today's guest. Thank you, Harley. Um, it is such a pleasure to introduce Mimi Lian to you all. Mimi's designs for theater, dance, and opera have been seen in the US uh, at Lincoln Center, the Signature Theater, Playwrights Horizons, the Public, Berkeley Rep, the Joyce, the Goodman, Soho Rep, the Wilma, Jacobs Pillow, as well as um, internationally in Russia, Taiwan, Germany, the Netherlands, among many others. Mimi's um, extraordinary work spans a wide spectrum from commercial theater, such as the Tony Award winning uh, Broadway, her Tony Award winning um, Broadway hit Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812, as well as the non for profit and avant garde spaces. Mimi is a member of the acclaimed Pig Iron Theater Company in Philly. She is the first ever set designer to be honored with a MacArthur Fellowship. And she's been honored with many awards, uh, including the Tony, the Lucille Lortel, Bessie, Obie, Barrymore, Hughes, and the LA Drama Critics Circle Awards, among others. Um, and a few years ago here at UMass Amherst, we were so lucky to have Mimi design Kaleidoscope 2.0, Adventures in Pre and Post-Racial America, which was created by Talvin Wilkes and Ping Chong and produced and dramaturged respectively by my colleagues, Judy Albulali and Priscilla Page. Mimi, welcome. I would like to start by talking about your design practice. You have this amazing, um, wonderful sense of materiality and its feeling and connotations. And I like to share images from two productions 
that um, in this in this context. Uh, so first, an octoroon by Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, which started at Soho Rep and moved to the theater for a new audience. Um, you had cotton balls all over the floor, and um, then the wall that fell on them, and uh, also the uh, other show. I want to mention in this context is um, Bertolt Brecht's Ball, done by Hoi Paloi at the Performance Space Jack in Brooklyn, New York, uh, of which you are a co-founder. And um, it's basically a bar space uh, where you covered all the walls and surfaces with tin foil. Um, so, can you talk about how those choices came about and how does uh, more generally thinking about and searching for materials fit into your process? Yeah, well, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, in terms of materiality, I think it it does go back to, I think, my you know early education. So I, I went to college for architecture, didn't know anything about theater, had very little experience with theater. I had seen very few <laughs> plays, I think, up through the time that I was in college. Um, so it was really un not until the year after I graduated from college, majoring in architecture, that I um, you know really became aware of set design and then decided to become a set designer um, or to pursue it. And so, but I think that this, um, this preoccupation with materials probably stems from this architecture education and thinking about, you know, really, um, you know, learning about the design of space as an experience and, and that space creating an atmosphere and the materials that you use to create that space, you know, contribute greatly to that atmosphere. So I think, you know, it's a big conversation in the architecture world of like mater materials. It's, it's sort of a, you know, a huge part of the design. So, you know, the different properties, you know, both physical properties, but also metaphorical properties, um, you know, like glass obviously has a completely different feeling from concrete. So, so, for me, uh, once I started designing sets, that that was you know basically when I was in school when I first started designing the first sets that I ever designed the first design projects I had, I I ended up um, developing this process where the first thing I would do basically when I started a design would be to go and search for what materials I would build the model out of. But really that was just a search for what material felt right for the project, right? So often when I just was faced with that empty model box and I didn't know what I was gonna do, I would roam around the city and go to these, you know, I had a couple of favorite haunts where I would just look at different materials. Sadly, a lot of those stores aren't there anymore, but, um, but there was this one place, Industrial Plastics, which was much more than a plastic store. They had all kinds of different things. So, so basically just going to a place where I could like touch the material, feel it, and just kind of think about the, you know, the piece in my head and be like, does this feel like that play or that opera? Um, does this material, does this plastic, does this color feel right? Does the transparency mean anything? Does the softness of it, like what is the feeling that I'm trying to, you know, uh, establish? Uh, through this space. And I know, you know, you mentioned this, this thing that I have said in the past about design, you know, set design not being about what it looks like, but what it feels like. And I think it does apply to materials, like technically, like literally, what does it feel like, but also, I think, to the entire design that, for me, it is not so much about making a picture, but creating a volume of space that is referencing perhaps a kind of architecture or not, you know, architecture or sculpture, but, but sculpting a space that gives the person who's looking at it a particular feeling. Um, you know, again, going back to architecture, I think about the example of Frank Lloyd Wright, who used to design 
you know, this sequence of spaces that you would go through as you move through the building. And it often was about like, oh, this is a sort of dark kind of, uh, you know, a dark small chamber, which then leads to a light filled tall chamber. But the, the feeling of these different spaces and the contrast between them um, was something that was very much thought about and orchestrated. So in this, you know, so then, you know, coming to an octoroon, uh, so that's sort of the background of <laughs> how I think about materials and design. And then with an octoroon, there was even something more particular, I think, why I ended up focusing on materials in the way that it was. So in, in Brandon's play, the first scene is a character who is, uh, who's playing Brandon, the playwright, and he's talking to the audience. It's sort of a direct address, almost like a stand-up comedy. Uh, routine. And, and then there are some stage directions where he indicates that perhaps this character goes to a, you know, a kiddie pool that's filled with white paint and, and starts smearing it on his face. Um, and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty confrontational the way that he, he's addressing the audience and like literally putting white, putting on white face in front of, in front of you. Um, you know, made me think about, I guess, per performance art. I mean, this could be a whole other <laughs> hour long conversation about the difference between performance art and theater. But, um, you know, perhaps it made me think about artists like M Marina Abramovich or, you know, these artists where who perform in gallery spaces where you can walk around them. But there's a kind of confrontation and tactility um, and like, making you feel feel something in your body that I, I think Brandon was really getting at that. And of course it is a play that it's his, his deconstruction of the play, uh, The Octoroon, which is a 19th century play written by an Irishman about slavery. And here is Brandon in the 2000s, black playwright writing his version of it. So, you know, obviously the question of race is very pointed. So basically I, I somehow decided at the beginning that I was going to make a list of materials, I think because of this stage direction of him putting paint on his face, or like a mud like um, substance, I decided I was going to make a list of materials like black materials and white materials. <laughs> so I like I made a list of like tar, molasses, coal, and then and the, you know, white materials, and stuff, you know, milk and cotton and sugar. And obviously, you know, all of these substances are very racially charged and historically, you know, have a lot of meaning and baggage. Um, so, but, but through that list, I ended up thinking about, you know, the material of a cotton ball um, as being this object that we all, you know, is, is very contemporary and, and, and seemingly pedestrian, but holds so much weight and history. And I knew that, you know, and the structure of the play was such that, you know, we go from this place to that place. It's, you know, it's a melodrama. The original play, The Octoroon is a melodrama. So we go from the plantation to the, to the dock and to the, you know, the, all these um, different locations, which I, I knew that in the space of Soho Rep, <laughs> which is like this tiny black box with no wings, we were not going to represent that literally. So so I started, you know, to formulate a little bit of an idea of how the spaces of the of the set would need to progress uh, with the play, and so I, I knew that I was going to represent the plantation somewhat in in a non naturalistic way, and then putting those two together, I thought maybe I'm just going to maybe the plantation will just be people knee deep in cotton balls, and that's kind of how uh, we arrived at that material and so this you know all of these first scenes of the play this melodrama um, take place with people shuffling through these cotton balls and then uh what ends up happening so we're not showing you the full sequence but this picture yeah this picture is uh what my first research photo which is um 
Steve McQueen, the filmmaker, recreating a, um, a stunt that Buster Keaton did back in the day, which was he's standing there by himself, you know, and then this, um, the, this facade of a house falls, but there happens to be a hole cut right where he's standing. And so there's this terrifying moment where it looks like the wall is going to fall on him, but he stays in the same place and doesn't move and, and is okay. And I basically decided to adopt that as a way that we move from scene to scene, because there is something about the, you know, the, the, you know, the rhythm, I guess, that the piece wanted to move where we were sort of felt like we were peeling back the layers of an onion. Um, I know that we're, we're still talking about materiality, <laughs> but, uh, but in terms of um, how the space moved, the, the wall would fall. First of all, we run a black box space and then the first wall, and then that wall fell and revealed a white space with cotton balls. And then, uh, and then the wall behind that also fell. And so what happened when that second wall fell on top of the cotton ball filled space was that the force of air caused by the falling wall propelled all of the cotton balls into the laps of the audience members, <laughs> um, which conveniently enough uh, in the play, there's this climax, right? The, the, the sensation scene is actually a trope of the melodrama that there's a sensation scene where there's some crazy theatrical trick like an explosion and so literally in the play the steamboat that's filled with barrels of cotton uh explodes and so that's what we did uh for that for that moment and i think the the thing that we didn't necessarily plan on or was a happy accident was was actually the the fact that the cotton you know, just literally like pelted all of the audience members in the face and people would walk home with cotton balls in their pockets and um, it's really and, intense. You know, confront the, the, you know, the legacy of slavery in their daily lives. That's incredible. And um, I uh, uh, I'm curious about the tinfoil on the how did how yeah. was born? <laughs> this was I mean, it was kind of a simpler thing. I will say that it, it was to some extent born out of necessity. I, I don't usually, the budget doesn't necessarily figure prominently in my early design thinking, unless it is like extreme, right? So for this show, uh, it was the first show at the Space Jack, which I founded with, which my husband founded uh, along with myself. And we literally had a budget of $250, you know, and it, as you said, it was a bar and we knew that we wanted the audience to be not in seats and be able to roam around and the performance took place in all different corners of the room. So we knew we, I knew, I knew we didn't need like a lot of set, you know, but I wanted to create an environment and the tone of the production, the way that um, the, the direction was going was that it was fairly punk rock and irreverent. And so I thought to myself, well, what's a material that, like we were, you know, listening to all this punk rock and loud music. I was like, what is a material that is like visually cacophonous, like visually loud is basically what I was looking for and cheap. <laughs> and so, so I landed on the idea of tinfoil, which, you know, which then I was like, okay, I'm going to go all out. I'm going to cover every surface. So we did all of the walls and, um, and then we had just this one element of a tree, which was also covered in tinfoil, but basically it's, it was, it was me thinking about what's a material that's visually loud. Amazing. So from material, um, to, uh, the experience of space, uh, your other great superpower, you're always designing the spatial experience for the audience, starting from when they first walk in that pathway, they take to their seats. You're thinking about that, not just what happens once they're sort of in their seats. So this is, um, uh, uh Natasha Pierre in the great comment of 1812. Um, this is the 
bunker tunnel that the audience moved through at the ART before arriving in a space uh, surrounded by red velvet and golden accents. This is um, when the production moved to Broadway. So um, I'm, I guess I'm curious on one hand about how, um, how you were thinking about this uh, entering um, through the bunker to get to the red velvet space. And um, also just to say this production moved, um, it actually started um, at Ars Nova uh, which was a um, more modest space than Broadway, um, where this is sort of the Broadway ground plan. And mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about the development of uh, the ground plan, which kind of ushers people um, in this experience, how it went from this to, uh, to something that looked like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you come up with these curly cues? So that's kind of a bunch of questions in one feel free talk at large. Yeah, sure. Well, in terms of the approach, I mean, I started talking about it a little bit earlier about the Frank Lloyd Wright kind of designing the sequence of spaces. And so that for me is very much what the bunker uh, is rooted from in terms of composition. In terms of why though, um, it really comes from, you know, at the first design meeting that I had with Dave Malloy and Rachel Chavkin, Dave was describing when he was on his research trip to Russia while he was writing the piece, um, he had, what, there was one night in Moscow where he was taken by a friend one night to a bar. It's one of those nights when you're in a foreign country, you don't know the city, you're being led down these dark alleys. And then suddenly there was this like, amazing bar you know you open it and it just it fills you with warmth and he went in and you know sat down and there was music playing and sat down at a table with strangers and just started drinking and eating pierogies and <laughs> and that basically was the seed of the you know the event of this show what that wanted to feel like so dave basically described his kind of wandering lost approach and then and then being inside and being enveloped in this warmth he basically we had some version of that in every iteration of the show so even at ars nova where you know it's a tiny cabaret space and we had 87 seats ultimately normally you enter the space in the door that's on the left side of this ground plan at ground street level you go through a lobby and then you go straight into the space we ended up having people go in through this other door that was a couple doors down, which then led down a flight of stairs through the dressing rooms and back up the back set of stairs, which typically only the actors would use. And so basically it served to disorient the audience. And so they didn't know where they were going. And then when they finally entered the space, it was not like the space that they had been, if they have been to that theater before, they just were like, I didn't even know where I was. So it was a little bit about like disorienting them. And I think when you're disoriented, your senses kind of perk up, right? When you're like, I don't know where I am. I don't know what this is. Your senses perked up, perk up, and you start taking note of things around you and your environment a little bit more. And that was kind of my intention of like, you know, kind of making, making things a little bit unfamiliar um, and then you then you really become more aware of your body and the and the space that it's in. And so there was that, and and wanting to to really create um, a a big contrast between that journey space and the arrival space. I mean, also dramaturgically, one of the first lines in the musical is there's a war going on out there, and you know, and then we're all inside here. Um, reminds me of that movie Underground, right, where everybody's in this bunker together and there's something going on outside. So there's a real sense of outside and inside, um, you know, in terms of aesthetics. I think, you know, we were never trying to represent Russia again in any sort of naturalistic or um, historical way. It's all kind of anachronistic and, you know, so I think there is some association of Cold War bunker from the 80s. And then there's this kind of aristocratic, lush version of Russia that is this red and gold interior. 
Um, so, so that's a little bit about like why and, you know, and the composition of the approach in terms of the ground plan. Yeah, that was an early, early sketch for the Broadway version. I mean, I guess in terms of ground plan, I, you know, curves are, curves were not really a thing that <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that I really have any signature style, but like, I, I, I wouldn't say that there are a lot of sets, uh, designs that I, that I've created that have a ton of curves, but this one felt like basically I was at an early workshop and there was one song that Natasha sings and I was like, oh, it feels like she should be like on a path and like weaving her way around it. Just the music felt like it was leading Natasha on a curving path. That was basically the genesis of the Ars Nova design, which then led to a bunch of staging. Yeah, so this, so the this kind of curving bar shape, the S shape at the bottom was like, I literally was sitting in that Ars Nova space at a workshop thinking, listening to that song and thinking she should be walking on a curving path. And so um, that, you know, was present in every iteration. I love that, thank you. So um, kind of related to uh, creating pathways for people to, to move through, I, I wanted to ask you about, um, uh, I, I see you as um, taking and making room for agency across disciplinary boundaries in your um, work on installation projects. Uh, usually said designers are responding to a script, a directorial vision and um, within the envelope of a bigger producerial vision. Um, but I, I see you finding opportunities to be like a leading creative voice in your installation project. So for example, Model Home uh, commissioned by um, the La Jolla Playhouse. Um, installations are a genre where a designer can also be like a director and a playwright. Um, and we think of installations as a genre that lives more on the territory of the fine arts uh, or um, public art. So you entering this sphere as a scenic designer is already interesting. How did this um, commission uh, come about? Um, it sounds so kind of unusual for a set designer to be invited. Had you done many other installations before? Um, and I'm just curious in, in, in this new role for a set designer or this unusual role to be to guide narrative and for me it also relates to your architectural background because of course architects are the playwrights potentially in collaboration with clients um and uh and also i'm just going to share a few of these um photos of model home yeah i can talk a little bit about these as you're showing them maybe uh, yeah, I mean, I think very much, I think, again, because of my architecture background, I've always had a big interest in public space. And I think it's something that I wrestle with with theater a little bit in terms of access and who has access. I think, I don't think it's actually totally true of architecture. I think a lot of architects end up designing high end residential homes for wealthy people, you know, but I think for me, there was always this sort of utopian goal of you know designing a space that for the betterment of you know humanity at large and that people wouldn't have to buy a ticket to experience it that if you're building something in public space just walking through it you know a well-designed space would would have a positive impact on on anyone who happens to be walking through there so I've always had a desire to work outside of the theater for that reason, for a kind of accessibility um, that you don't have to, it's not for a particular population who buys a ticket to go, you know, and, and maybe an expensive ticket. And so not everybody can afford it. So, so there's always been that desire. And uh, prior to this, I had had really only a couple of opportunities to create installations and they were in the context of a performance festival um, in Philadelphia. There was a Philadelphia International Festival of the Arts 
which was put on at venues all around the city. And I was commissioned to create a kind of sculptural installation in the Kimmel Center, which was the hub of the festival. And they wanted something physical to designate it as the hub. So that was great. I mean, it was a great opportunity and it's sort of because I got to know some people as, you know, through designing sets in Philadelphia, had met someone and, you know, and then, and I think they knew about my interest in public space and, and therefore invited me to do that. So I had a couple of opportunities here. Um, the without, so this is, this was produced by the La Jolla Playhouse, but they have a festival called Without Walls, which is um, a festival of site specific work or work in non traditional spaces, mostly outdoors. And I guess I had this opportunity because the that year the curator of the festival is someone who I knew, Mayin Wang, uh, who's a director, um, worked in New York for a long time at the public theater at Under the Radar. So she again is someone within the theater community who was familiar with my work and my inclinations towards working in public space and and so that particular year, they were actually expanding from the La Jolla campus, which is up outside of the city of San Diego. They were actually going to do the festival in downtown San Diego that year. And so I basically was asked to, you know, create a site specific uh, installation, which always which also had a performance element to it. And so what I ended up doing was I went there for an extended weekend, walked around the city nonstop for four days to find a site that would like inspire, you know, uh, an install, a physical installation and also a performance. And I honestly didn't, I didn't feel like I found I found the the site immediately um, what, during those four days. It's like it's you know San Diego is like a very beautiful and kind of quiet city. Um, it's not uh, there's not a lot of edges. There's not a lot of like grit and things that I tend to be attracted to. <laughs> so, um, but then I, I after I left that weekend, I found myself really unable to stop thinking about these kind of mental pictures of the, the homeless population in San Diego. And I knew from talking to people there that everyone was like, oh, San Diego, the housing, the housing crisis, the housing crisis it seemed to be a big topic of conversation there. And in fact, I noticed that in the downtown area, there was a big revitalization effort. There were tons of construction cranes that were building like high rise luxury condos. Meanwhile, um, there were these enormous tent cities of homeless folks and visually that looked very different to me than the homeless population in New York City, where they're more dispersed and like in subways and, you know, on street corners, but they're not so much like encampments. And it was a little dark, like it was kind of unforgettable. I couldn't really um, get it out of my head. and very much also in juxtaposition with the cranes that were building the high rise um, luxury condos. And so then I just, I conceived of this installation, which was about <clears throat> the housing, about home really, like the question of home and homelessness and what does a home mean? And is housing, you know, a basic human right? Like all of these questions. So I, I, I had this image of a crane that was holding like a little monopoly house um, up in the sky. But that was sort of my image for the physical installation. And then the crane also uh, performed a ballet. <laughs> I call it the crane ballet. So did a, a bit of choreography where the house kind of spun around um, and went up and down on the crane. But I also felt like I, as someone who doesn't live in San Diego, I really felt like I needed to engage with the population. So then the other portion of the piece came from me interviewing lots of San Diego residents, um, homeless people, people with homes, people who've lived there for a long time, not for a long time, about these ideas of home. And then within each of those five houses that are on the ground, it was um, 
an installation inside each of the houses that was inspired by these interviews that I had. So, you know, some per one person was like, oh, I remember, you know, a birthday party um, was my memory of home or like, oh, I remember going down into the basement and watching slideshows of family photos or old mov movies, like Super 8 movies of families. Um, and then another one, the next one is, uh, someone said like, home to me is when I come home and somebody is making soup, you know? So I had this guy, <laughs> this actor who made soup all day inside one of these houses. And, and so the audience could come and peer into them through these little peepholes, um, which is what that little girl was doing in that earlier, or in the next photo, there's people peering in. Extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Connected is you kind of taking that narrative agency back to the theater. And uh, I just want to mention super, um, super ter terrain, oh my God. Super terrain, yeah. Terrain with a uh, pig iron company in 2019, where um, uh, I'm gonna flip through these amazing images while I say that um, there are these unusual credits of concept scenario and set design by Mimi Lian and scenario and direction by Dan Rothenberg. And in the video, he speaks about wanting to like hook up um, uh, a, a sense, sensing device to your brain and like get the whole uh, rehearsal room running from, from your engine. So how, how was that? This was characterized as a piece of visual, visual theater. And um, I've never heard that term before, but I like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think this came about, I guess Dan would call it designer as author. So basically back in 2006 was the first time I worked with Pig Iron. And, you know, Pig Iron is a company of physical theater performers who devise ensemble work, original work. So it's always, there's no script, right? It's a bunch of actors, the whole team, including designers coming together around an idea and then improvising and then the material comes out of improvisation so already there as a designer um, working in that mode one has more input into you know you throw something in in rehearsal for an improvisation you you know and then the performers respond to it and create something out of that so there's a lot more direct um, input into the content from designers uh, but from that experience, I think we just always thought, wouldn't it be cool if rather than starting with uh, text or found text even, or even, you know, Pig Iron has collaborated with a composer. So then in that case, the composer was the lead, but that has a precedent, you know, like opera, right? But so rarely is a piece created that springs from the, the set design. And so that's what we set out to do. And the reason why it's a work of visual theater is because it it ended up having no words. Um, and that wasn't premeditated. It, I didn't necessarily think, imagine that that's what the piece was like, would be like. I, I imagined that I was gonna design a set. And I think, you know, as designers, I'm sure all of us, right? As you're doing research for another piece, you come across an arresting image and you're like, oh, that would be an amazing set. I don't know what it would be a set for, but it would be an amazing set. Like there's something evocative about the image, something off, something strange. Um, so it kind of came from that of like 15 years of me collecting those images of like, this would be an amazing set. I don't know what for, but something. And so then it's like, okay, I'm gonna now make a set and then let the actors loose on it and see what they make. Um, but then when we started making things for some reason, like whenever, like talking didn't quite feel right. Um, and I will say that, you know, conceptually one day Dan just asked me what my obsessions were, uh, in terms of like, you know, what, what's the core of this piece? What is that going to be? And I ended up telling him this story about how, when I am driving by there's this huge refinery um, in New Jersey when you drive outside of New York from New York to Philly there's this giant refinery and it's like 
factory belching smoke and spitting flames out of the smokestacks and it, it's, it's endless it seems vast and huge and there's no people it feels sort of like a post-human landscape to me and i just was like i've been driving by that place ever since i was a kid and i always just felt really emotional whenever i would look at it but i never really tried to parse like why why that was and so I ended up telling him this story and then we talked about it and I was like, I think there's it's something about like the fact that humans obviously built this, right? Like we built it, we conceived of it, we invented all of the technology and yet it's also, you know, going to bring about our demise or like, you know, because visual, it looks like a post-human landscape and the pollution and all of that, you know, but there's something about the tension between this like, kind of pride like and then it extended into like infrastructure in general like huge infrastructure like dams you know things that you know purport to control natural forces like divert rivers right like there's a certain amount of hubris in that but also it's kind of amazing that humans did that like these soft fleshy six foot high bodies um you know, build that. So there's this tension between this pride and awe, and then also like a despair, I think, at the potential for these creations to outlast us or perhaps lead to our demise. And so, and something about like physically these hard, unforgiving, concrete structures and our like soft, squishy human bodies. So, so physically it became about that collision. Um, and so that that's what this piece ended up kind of being about. <laughs> thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, I'm gonna open it up uh, shortly to the audience, but I just wanna uh, finish with a question about women in design. Um, you've modeled so much, and also you're kind of in the minority. Um, Porsche McGovern survey uh, uh, discovered that 28.8% um, are women um, doing designing uh, scenery in Lort theaters. And uh, when you go up to the um, theaters that pay the most, uh, the number goes down to 13.6%. So as a minority, I'm curious what challenges you have encountered in a male dominated space. And if you can share any strategies for overcoming uh, for all the young women tuning in who want to be scenic designers at a very yeah. exclusive level yeah well first of all i feel like the word minority i was just um on a zoom panel and i wasn't participating but watching a webinar last night uh, that was talking you know about bipoc folks in the theater community and the word minority and being like actually you know what like people of color are the global majority so the word minority perhaps is not helpful i mean and and then i guess in terms of you know, women being in the minority, sure, like in the theater industry, these statistics are what they are. But in the world, women are actually like very slightly um, in the in the majority. Um, and so I guess I will say just from my own personal experience, I I don't know that I was super aware of it for a while, like really, maybe not until I designed Natasha Pierre on Broadway, because in my childhood, like I was, I was, I think, surrounded by women who were, who were working in these, you know, maybe traditionally male dominated spaces. Like my mom was teaching, she was a professor of computer science. And, you know, so when she got her degree in computer science in the seventies, I'm sure she was the only per woman in her department but that was sort of the model that I had. Like I had a mom who was really good at computers and math and that was what I knew. And then I've been fortunate to have, you know, a lot of female mentors um, in, in, the, in set design as well. You know, like Christine Jones was someone who I assisted. And um, I, so I guess I, I do feel like I, perhaps it was helpful to not feel like there was something I was 
trying to overcome but in fact i was just like you know i i felt like i had female mentors and so i do think that that's really really important um uh, but then yes i think once you get to a sphere like broadway it it became a little bit more evident uh you know that i was that i was in fact more and more surrounded by men and i think what did i do to compensate i guess i guess i just did everything i could to be to do my job well you know to if if i if if people were challenging me then i would do everything that i could i would do my homework in order to meet the challenge you know i mean just just a couple of days ago, I was having a meeting with an architect about a project and and uh, we were dealing with some code stuff, right, which I had to do a lot of with <laughs> Natasha Pierre. It just gets really, really technical. And, you know, because I have done a lot of work with code, I, I, I addressed it in my design and in my drawings. And the architect was kind of like, oh, I was actually kind of impressed that you, you know, you seem to know all this code. So I guess it's it's about doing your, you know, I did try to always be prepared and have, you know, be able to back up everything that I was presenting. Amazing. Thank you. Um, there's a question from the audience. And did you study visit Wright's Dallas Theater Center with all its curving spaces? I'm assuming this is in the context. Did I study Dallas Theater Center? No. <laughs> I don't know. I guess that's a simple answer. Something no. to, to check out. I yeah. Guess. Um, uh, I'm going to jump in with a, a question on behalf of young designers. Um, when you were starting out uh, and you couldn't yet, uh, weren't yet in a position to choose who to work with, how did you, did you take all of the gigs that you were offered or based on what criteria did you choose jobs? Yeah, I think this is, you know, this is where I feel like our industry is shifting a little bit. I, you know, when I was right out of grad school, I did, I sort I did basically take everything. I mean, I was, I assisted. And so I was assisting another designer. I think I did for about four years. I was very regularly assisting and I was lucky that I was assisting someone who, who I, I had a lot to learn from and he also let me work in his studio space like I, it was a very um I think symbiotic relationship and beneficial to me so I I could pay my bills by assisting and then I designed my little you know $500 shows now now I think we would say hey maybe we shouldn't have $500 shows anymore <laughs> you know um I think that is a big part of why there's not, not equity in our industry, because not everybody can afford to do the five, you know, the $200 shows, the $500 shows. But yes, I mean, if you're asking me what I did, I definitely did basically do everything. I mean, I think I was also fortunate that, you know, I, 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 I as I said, I, assisted Christine Jones. I went to NYU. It was through after I graduated, Christine had kind of put me together with a director, a young director who she she introduced me to him. And so we worked together on a show. And then, you know, things one thing, you know, he recommended me to a friend of his after that. And that's kind of how it goes, right? So but I would say basically for a while, for definitely the first couple of years, I I did do everything because I felt like I had something to learn from doing it because I had no because I didn't have an undergrad theater experience. The only shows that I had ever designed and that were produced were in grad school. And it was only one per year because in my view, it's it's not a very production at the time. It wasn't a very production heavy program. And so I just wanted to do as much as I could and I think I was fortunate that the projects that came my way were not things that I was like, oh, my, like that I was offended by or, or anything. So, yes, I, I did just just to kind of really get as much experience as possible. 
Thank you. I have a great question from a fine young designer. How do you balance your interest in material with the theatrical tradition of faux surface? Do you lose something when material is replicated with paint? That's such a great question <laughs> and something that I've wrestled with for so long. I mean, uh, so I guess the simple answer is that I, my inclination is to always use re real materials. My inclination is not to replicate things with paint. Now that is a little tricky because of the economics of theater. And so you can't always use the real material because it's only going to be up for four weeks versus a building that's going to be up for years and years and you can afford to spend more money on it. So there is a limitation, I think, uh, in terms of materials in the theater, but I would say that I tend, unless I absolutely, you know, there's a couple of instances where where one has to, or or if the concept is that it's very fake, then you know, then then I'll do that. But but I basically try, I, I, I steer away from faux painting as much as possible. Um, what do you think will be the new normal for theater making and gathering crowds as we crawl slowly out of the pandemic? Perhaps less traditional theater spaces and more outdoor, publicly accessible performances installations? Yeah, also a great question. I mean, I think that, you know, <laughs> that ball is still up in the air and we'll see where it lands. But I have definitely been very heartened by the innovation that has come about and that we've all witnessed um, in this past year. You know, definitely uh, the proliferation of sound walks and, yeah, like experiential things like site specific performances, um, outdoor performances in non traditional spaces. Um, I, I mean, I, I love all of that. Um, as you've seen from the work earlier today, I'm very much about the experiential. Uh, so I, I do, you know, but, but then again, people, there's nothing that will replace sitting in a room with a lot of other people and experiencing the same thing. So I guess I think that we will go back, you know, go back to that to some extent. But I, I do think, you know, just like I don't think Zoom is really ever going to go away now at this point, <laughs> like there will be some vestiges. And some of them are great. Like I think, again, about accessibility, what one silver lining has been that I think that new audiences have been garnered for, for theater, like people are able to people who per perhaps, you know, wouldn't have bought a ticket to go to the theater before, maybe family and friends of, of performers or people who are working in the theater now are able to experience the work, which I think is a silver lining. So I guess I think in the future is perhaps a more hybrid um, form or both and inclusive both. Nice. Um, there's a few questions around the transition from architecture to set design and um, uh, how it happened and whether you had to retrain in some way, um, whether you feel that your architectural background strengthened your set design skills. So if you can talk about that a little. Yeah, so in terms of how it happened, literally, uh, you know, I, my undergrad degree was in architecture, but from a fairly, you know, from a liberal arts school, so it wasn't very technical and, um, but that was my background. And then I, uh, you know, I was, <laughs> I won't tell the long story, but, but I was in Italy um, studying painting for a year, the year after college, and then slowly started making objects and installations while I was doing that. And so that basically was what led to, you know, basically through, through my college career, I was slowly becoming more and more interested in visual art. So for me, I was trying to f combine um, architecture and visual art. And 
basically, you know, the idea of set design, uh, uh, one of my teachers in Italy actually said to me one day, have you ever considered set design? And so I was like, oh yeah, that seems great. And so I, the transition basically was that I went to graduate school because I, 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 I did work for a little while actually in film um, when I was like, yes, I think I'm interested in set design, but I don't know anything about it and I don't know anyone. Um, and so I found my way to working on production, you know, on a film set in the art department. And I did that for two years, realized that, yes, I do like set design, but I'm not sure that I want to do it for film. I think I, I would be interested in the abstraction and the freedom that a theatrical set design would offer. And then I was like, I don't know anything about theater. So then I went to grad school and that's how the transition literally happened. Um, I will say that I, I personally do think that an architecture background has been very helpful to me because I think everything that we build, it, you know, is, is somehow rooted in just this idea of building and aesthetics and, and what, uh, what all the connotations of the different <clears throat> ornament um, and details are. So, so yes, I feel like I use my architecture education all the time. I don't really feel like I had to retrain. It's not like there's anything that uh, is that I had to unlearn about architecture. I think there were just things that I had to add on in terms of the context of designing for theater. Um, I also don't think that it's a different process or that suddenly, um, oh, I'm designing a set. That's different from designing a, a house or another kind of space. I actually think that it's all about how do I design an orchestra this particular feeling that I want to create? But with the theater, how it's going to be viewed impacts, you know, that design. So sight lines are definitely a thing. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to angle the walls and make everything visible to everyone. You can decide that some things are not going to be seen or that everybody's going to have a different perspective, but you just have to keep that in mind. Um, so, so I would say it's just basically learning, uh, you know, on top of learning a theatrical context on top of the architecture foundation. Mimi, we're at the end of our time together. Thank you so much for your inspiration and your, your leadership as an, as an artist and a thinker. So great to, to have you with us today. Thank you so and much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope you have a beautiful rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.